traditional super fun and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, everybody. Melanie Hall here. Hope you are doing well. The conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition, traditional homestead living, traditional raw milk products, and traditional cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add the taste of tradition to your life. In today's podcast, Best Animals for a Homestead, is the topic. We, Scott and I, have tried many and plan to try a few more as far as different uh, kinds of of animals. The best animals for a homestead will depend on your goals and land situation and your philosophy. I'll talk about our thought processes and how we came to choose our animals and specific breeds. Let me take a minute to say welcome to all the new listeners and welcome back to the veteran homestead loving regulars who stop by the farm cast for every episode. If it were not for you, this show would not exist. I appreciate you all and hope you and your families are doing well. I'm so excited to share with you what's going on at the farm this week and kind of weave that in with why, what animals we have and why we chose them. Uh, Because this podcast is generally about the best animals for a homestead, I'll keep the garden and fruit portion relatively short. Uh, As far as the garden, it is amazing. I've said it before and I'll say it again. We love this ground cover, uh, the woven fabric ground cover. The plants are thriving like they never have before. Even with the harsh heat we've been experiencing, everything is thriving. The tomatoes are coming on strong. Uh... There's, there seem to be only a few tomatoes for a while, but, but now when I go out there, I see every plant has many, many tomatoes. It won't be long now. And the only type of tomato I'm growing this year is a paste tomato. I will get my slicing tomatoes from other vendors at the farmer's markets. My tomato crop is specifically designed to produce lots of tomatoes to be used in making tomato sauce and barbecue sauce. Peppers are up next. Uh, you can't have tomato plants without pepper plants, right? They are all doing so well. The sweet banana peppers started bearing first, then the jalapeno, then and cayenne started ripening. I've harvested only one green bell pepper, but many more are in the near future. They just need to get a bit bigger. It's going to be a fabulous year for peppers. That green bell pepper was out of this world. And I like to cut up banana pepper, a banana pepper and uh sprinkle it over my eggs while they're cooking and then the peppers get cooked just enough to add their fabulous flavor to the eggs. Potatoes. All of the potatoes, all the spring potatoes have been harvested. We had about 75 square feet of red potatoes and 25 square feet of Yukon gold potatoes. Most of them were quite small so the plants were really good but the uh, potatoes ended up quite small but they were also quite healthy. They're the size of new potatoes about two to three inches in diameter. Some are bigger than that, but the majority of them are like two to three inches. And I'm treating them as such rather than curing and firming the skins like I would for a a big potato that I want to store for a long time. I'm letting them be there with their thin skins and they're so perfect for boiling and roasting. In the past, we've lost many potatoes before getting them out of the ground due to like rotting with the fungus. And again, this time, all the potatoes were healthy. And I'm ready to plant again for a fall crop. Maybe they'll be bigger this time. I started picking Crowder peas a few days ago. uh, And then again last night I I picked them. I'll wait another day or two and give them another go. I have great luck with Crowder peas every year. And it appears this year will be a bumper crop year. These, The ones I have this year are purple hulled Crowder peas. We love Crowder peas. Now, this is my first year for really growing basil and uh, some on the other culinary herbs that I have out there, too. But I'm really pleased with how easy the basil is to grow. I'm packaging up two cup bags to take to the farmer's market. Come see us on Saturdays in Whitfield, Virginia, 8 a.m. to noon. I'm including a fresh basil pesto recipe with every purchase. And if you're not in my area and want the recipe, I'll put a link in the show notes. 
or just hop over to the website at uh, peacefulheartfarm.com and select recipes from the menu. It will be at the top of the list and you can print off that basil pesto recipe. Fabulous. Make some up, toss it into your pasta, use it in salad dressing, all kinds of different ways you can use it. The oregano and thyme are also doing really well and the parsley and cilantro don't look so good. I'll have to investigate how to do better with those two. I think the rosemary will also do well, but it grows much slower. Uh, because we have lamb, we use a lot of rosemary, and I love it when it's fresh. Uh, dried works okay, but fresh is the best. And I have a little bit of mint growing here and there also, and I want to try a mint sauce recipe with our lamb. I haven't had the opportunity to do that so far, and I'm looking forward to it. I may make some mint jelly as well. Sometimes mint sauce recipes use mint jelly or offer it as a substitute to fresh mint or in conjunction with fresh mint. Now, as far as the fruit, the blackberry bushes are producing lots of fruit. However, it is such a jungle down there that I'm not really able to harvest the berries. We've been doing other tasks and have let them get overgrown. Blackberry canes are very prolific. Uh, perhaps you've had some wild ones invade your space. They can be a real pain. Most of our, uh, actually all of our blackberries are thornless, but there are many wild volunteers that make picking the berries a greater challenge. So they've gotten in there. They have berries too, but of course they've got those thorn, thorns. So they're, it's a bit of a challenge to pick down there. I mean, it's certainly, it's not as much of a challenge as picking from a patch that is entirely wild, that has an abundance of thorns, but it's a hindrance just the same, because just when you think that you can just, like, pick as you choose, all of a sudden you'll get caught up on one of these briars that you weren't expecting. I really enjoy picking pear berries when there are no thorns. <laughs> well, I need, I guess we just need to take a day to go in there with hedge trimmers and cut out the overgrowth and clear out the wild ones. I'm pretty sure they already have a pretty good foothold and are solidly mixed in with our thornless ones. But with diligent effort, I think we can keep them under control. It's just one of those homestead jobs that is not really fun. Some things on the homestead are wonderful and others are really unpleasant. Getting my ankles ripped up by blackberry thorns is unpleasant. I guess I could wear thick socks, but it's so hot out there. Is it hot where you are? <sighs> All right, moving on to the animals, kind of our topic of today. I'll give a health and wellness update and then some information on how we came to have a particular animal. And after I cover what we have, I'll go into some that we want to have but don't have yet. So first of all, the sheep. Sheep were the first animals that we added to the homestead in 2010. We started with a dozen pregnant ewes and we added a breeding ram and we grew the flock to over 70 animals. And then we scaled back to our present flock of six to eight ewes and one ram. This year we had eight ewes and now have added nine lambs. All are doing well and keeping together for the most part. Um, and the health of our flock has steadily improved over the years. We chose Katahdin sheep. It is a meat breed as opposed to a fiber breed where you would get the wool. They're referred to as hair sheep. That means that they shed their wool every spring. Or sometimes they don't even have thick wool. It's just like the thick hairy coat. So we do not need to keep up with having them sheared every year. There are other hair sheep, but after research, we decided on Katahdin due to their excellent mothering instincts and their ability to thrive on pasture. They have internal parasite issues uh, that are comparable to other breeds. I don't think there's any way to get around that issue. Um, breeding for parasite resistance and managing our pastures has improved our flock health tremendously, but they're still going to have parasites. And if I knew in the beginning what we know now, we would have asked a few more pertinent questions before purchasing. We would have looked at the eyelids inside of the eyelids of a few of the ewes before we bought them. That's called uh, looking at the uh, Fomacha score. The, the flock we purchased came with a heavy worm load. They literally needed to be wormed every three or four months just to keep them and their lambs alive. And indeed, we lost a few ewes and lots of lambs before we got it under control. Naive as we were, we did not even know it would be a problem. 
Oftentimes, we as humans go into a situation thinking everyone thinks and acts as we do, and that is a great illusion. They would, of course, be caring for their animals in a manner similar to our plan. Not true. Anyway, over the years, we've learned how to tell when they are stressed, when the sheep are stressed with parasites, and we act quickly to bring it under control. And because of this kind of husbandry, we no longer have what I would call real issues with parasites. We may go an entire year or more without using any chemical wormer at all. In other years, it may be only one or two animals that get treatment, in, and in the past four or five years, we have not had to use much at all. This spring, not one single animal needed treatment, and we've checked them twice, and we haven't used it either time. And in the spring is when they, the worms really come on strong. And they still have parasites, and we have, then we have to monitor them, and we have certain times of the year that we monitor them very closely. But they're able to handle, handle it effectively. And a healthy flock can be maintained without chemicals. Pasture maintenance and management is the key. Well, good genetics are also important. But even the best genetics will fail if the pastures are not managed well. Now let's talk about the donkeys. The donkeys were the next animal to be added to the homestead. We got them pretty quickly after getting the, the uh, sheep. And we chose miniature donkeys. Working with small animals was what we were comfortable with. And these beauties fit the bill. Daisy was pregnant with Sweet Bee when we purchased her. And both are still on the homestead and both are doing very well. Sweet Pea ended up being bigger than her mom. I'm not sure she would even qualify as a miniature. Uh, they, they must be 36 inches or less at the shoulder. A few years later, we added Johnny, and he produced several foals for us, including Coco, whom we still have, some others we sold. He produced so prolifically that we decided that enough was enough. We wanted to keep him, so we enlisted the vet to uh, change him from a Jack to a John. A male donkey is called a Jack, and the females are Jennies. It is fitting, is it not? A John is a gelded Jack. So Johnny is a John. He will no longer produce Jennies. There's another term for Jenny before they have their first foal, but I can't remember it right now. Anyway, Johnny and Coco are doing well. The problem we have with the donkeys right now is that we simply don't need four. Uh, four was great when we had 70 and we had flocks and divided into different areas, but they're mostly all together now. So um, eventually we'll be selling Johnny and Sweet Pea. Daisy has always been a favorite, and Coco is my next favorite. So those are the ones we'll be keeping. They're just so friendly and loving. A Sweet Pea is an attention hog. She's so friendly, she will keep pushing and nudging you from behind for more attention. It's a little annoying. Uh, Johnny's quite shy, but if he get if he lets you get close, he really enjoys a good scratch as much as the girls do. And we chose donkeys as guard animals for the sheep and lambs. And ours are very good at it. They have kept the coyotes away. We only had one bad incident with coyotes. Uh, spring lambing was in full swing. It rained heavily one night, and the pond flooded out into the field. The donkeys were caught on one side and the sheep and lambs were on the other side and there was a set of triplets that were born we came out to find those three lambs had been destroyed by the coyotes but again that was the only incident we've lost a lamb here and there to other predators but the coyotes stay away that was and is always the main concern i have with sheep and lambs coyotes can be devastating to a flock of sheep now let me talk about the cows and calves i'll start out with saying that all of the cows and calves are doing very well. I've started using a natural fly spray and it is working. I am very pleased. Flies are a real problem when you have cattle. It's the poop, you see. Flies love to use it as a breeding ground. The And, and cows make a lot of poop. But with uh, a few squirts of my special fly spray twice a day, we are keeping them at bay. We did have that issue with Luna and Pink Eye that I talked about last time. But I'm keeping a close watch on her and making sure she gets her fly spray twice a day. The spray doesn't diminish the fly population. And later we will have chickens to help keep the fly population down. More on that later. As I've mentioned before, we have Normandy cows. For you guys that are new, there's a whole podcast on why we chose Normandies. I'll put a link in the show notes. 
and I'll just summarize it here. It started off with me wanting to have a family cow for milk, butter, and cheese. And quickly that grew to wanting a small herd to make handmade farmstead cheese. We chose the Normandy breed for one main reason, along with a few more kind of major minor reasons. The main reason is that they are a dual breed cow. We needed to have a calf every year to have milk, and the calf would be grown out for meat. And uh, that's what you do with the calf every year. You sell it or, you know, whatever. We were going to grow it out for beef for us. That was the original plan. The dual breed was perfect for that. The calf would produce excellent meat and the cow would produce excellent meat, m milk. Because usually a cow is either excellent at producing beef or prolific in making milk. And the Normandy does both. And there are other breeds that are considered dual breeds, but we settled on the Normandy. And some of that was be they they produce was because of some of the other major and minor characteristics that are important to us. Uh, I did want to make cheese in the Normandy, as well as being a dual breed, was genetically bred in France to produce the finest cheese. They produce milk volume uh, along the lines of a Jersey. They have the cream that are along the lines of a Jersey. But they're also bred to sustain themselves on grass. And we did not know how great a boon that was until we purchased that Jersey and saw how much supplemental grain she required just to maintain her weight. The Normandies have no such requirement and still produce similar amounts of milk and cream levels. So we really like those Normandies. Other great things are that they have extremely beautiful coats. If you've ever seen the pictures of them, just unique and gorgeous and beautiful. They're docile, very docile. And here again, the Jersey cow gave us the true contrast there. Sure, the, the Jersey, she has those beautiful and gentle eyes. Uh, but let me tell you, they can be quite aggressive, mostly with the other cows. She's aggressive, but she certainly has challenged us from time to time as well. Not strongly, but we just never get that from the Normandies. There's no challenge whatsoever. They might be stubborn and not move, but they're not ever going to like put their head down and um, give you that look. So we will eventually sell her and stay with our Normandies. She's a lovely cow, and we've learned a lot. But the Normandy is a cow for us. We purchased Claire and Buttercup in 2011. Claire was bred to an Angus bull and gave birth to a lovely calf. Uh, Willis has been gone for many years, but I still remember the joy of that first calf being born. So Buttercup was her younger sister, full sister to Claire, and just one year, one year younger. And then the next year, so we had Claire and Buttercup. And the next year, we added Cloud, Violet, and Lily. We also purchased a bull, Teddy, with that lot. So we got four cows all at once. And Teddy was sold a few years back when we were going to go to AI. And that's, I'm not going to get into the details of what happened with that. He was a great bull. Uh, when we got Cloud, she was a bred heifer. And uh, Violet and Lily were just really young. But uh, Cloud was a bred heifer, and she gave birth to Dora. And unfortunately, we actually lost Dora last year. She had complications following a breech calf. Well, the complications likely happened before the birth began. She was two weeks early, hence the breech position. And uh, she had a subsequent infection that took her down just three days after giving birth. Really quickly, she was gone. Now, we purchased Butter, a Jersey cow, last year for her A2A2 milk. She was our seed for starting our herd share program. Uh, at that time, our cows had not been tested for the A2A2 genetic trait, and we wanted to offer A2A2 milk to our herd share customers. Uh, so, our, we have since had our cows tested, and uh, oh, I can't remember. Claire and Buttercup for sure are A2A2. I can't remember about the other to. Our current herd consists of the matriarch Claire and her sister Buttercup along with Cloud, Violet, and Butter. So Cloud and Violet, not sure, but Claire, Buttercup, and Butter are all A2A2 cows. That's five cows for the moment. We also have two heifers. Cloud gave birth to Luna in November last year and Buttercup gave birth to Virginia just five weeks ago. It will still be a while before the two heifers add milk to our supply. Luna will be bred 
summer 2021, next year, when we breed all the cows, she'll get bred with them. And she'll give birth to her first calf in the spring of 2022. Virginia will follow the year after. We could breed her in September or later in 2021 for a calf in the summer or fall of 2022. We shall see. It, it takes a while to build a herd. Now the goats, there, there's way too much information on various goats for my information here to be of much use. I wanted cashmere for goats, uh, cashmere fiber for my knitting projects. And there is no registered cashmere breed, though there is an American Cashmere Goat Association. With cashmere, it's all about the fiber. Lots of goat breeds produce cashmere. It's an undercoat that they grow in the wintertime. And a cashmere goat herd is simply one where selective breeding has produced the finest fiber. So it could have been of different breeds all put together. Uh, and that was my only criteria for a goat breed, other than we needed pasture maintenance. Goats are great at keeping those wild blackberries down. I can't turn them loose in the blackberries we're growing on purpose. Uh, they will not distinguish between wild, thorny, thorny blackberries and our lovely thornless ones. They will simply eat everything in sight. And they eat the briars and the wild roses as well. They're great for pasture maintenance. They eat, goats eat lots of plants that the cows and sheep won't touch. They'll keep small trees and bushes under control as well. Could be left alone, pastures would be filled with all kinds of bushes and young trees, especially pine trees. They can really take over the edges of a pasture quickly. Um, so future plans with the goats include thinning out the cashmere goats to nothing and then bringing in some uh, meat goats. Right now, Kiko is the breed at the top of my list there with Spanish goats waiting in the wings. They are both meat goats with low parasite loads and little hoof maintenance. Now, that's another reason for my change of heart with the goats, with the cashmere goats that they had. Our current herd requires regular hoof trimming or they'll get lame. And if I can shop well, the next one will not need hoof trimming. And that's all I'm going to say about the goats. You may not be thinking of milking goats or meeting. You may be thinking of milking goats or meat goats. But I really don't have a lot of information in those areas to add to your knowledge because I don't milk goats and I don't really have meat goats yet. So cashmere, if you got questions, I can help you out with that. Now the quail, the quail chicks are hatched. Yay! We have 52 in the brooders and four more that are still in the incubator. Now, two of those in the incubator will live. One other is a maybe will live, and the fourth is not going to make it. There's a problem with its legs, and it cannot stand. Let me back up a little bit. There's a lot to this story. Most of them hatched on Saturday, and they stay in the incubator for up to three days. So Tuesday morning is when we would normally put them in the brooder. They need to dry off, get some strength in their legs, and they need to be kept consistently warm. And the incubator provides that environment. So they were scheduled to go into the brooders on Tuesday, but that date changed to Monday based on a couple of different incidents. There were so many of them in there for one thing. They were just stepping all over each other. Um, but so much has happened that it's a little bit of a blur. I can't recall whether it was Saturday evening or Sunday evening when we were blessed with rain. And I thought, great, I don't have to water the garden. Watering the garden had become nearly a daily activity. And it was a tremendous thunderstorm, so tremendous that the power went out. The incubator was off, and those 50-plus babies were now in danger. they got to be kept warm, right? Consistently warm. And a call to the power company revealed that the power was guaranteed to be back on by 3 a.m. Good to know. But without the incubator or some other source of heat, those newly hatched quail would not survive. So Scott came to the rescue, as usual, my hero, and hooked up the generator and selectively turned on various breakers so that the incubator was functional. And it was quite the balancing act. The cows still needed to be milked, so he also turned on the breaker that would provide power to the portable milker. After that, the circuit breaker for the portable milker was turned off, and the one for the water pump was turned on so we could clean up the milking equipment and get a much-needed shower after 90 degrees. And then that one was turned off, and the circuits for the freezers were turned on just to get those back down to their uh, where they needed to be. 
And uh, thankfully, the power was back on long before 3 a.m. I think it might have been like 9 or 10 o'clock it was on. Now, the problem with the power going on and off in the incubator is it, it's stabilizing the heat and humidity. While they're just eggs, this has not really been a problem for me. But the last two batches required me to vent humidity and temperature in a very specific way, it, just, a, just a little to keep them to keep from suffocating the babies with the heat and humidity being too high. For, for whatever reason, when there are so many baby birds in there, the humidity goes off the scale and, and the machine has trouble maintaining the proper temperature. It, it, it just gets too hot. And to get to the point, the next night, I barely got any sleep at all. Somewhere between trying to stabilize the humidity and the temperature, I let it run out of water in the middle of the night. And when it gets either too high or too low, beep, 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 oh, just loud beeping to let you know, hey, you need to adjust this or your birds are going to be in trouble. So before it was trying to keep the humidity down and the temperature down, but now I let it run out of water that's in the bottom tray to keep that that provides the humidity. And so now the humidity was too low and I added water back to the tray and it was really slow bringing the humidity back up. So I closed the lid completely to wait for the humidity to come back up and I go to, back to bed. And that, of course, caused the temperature to get too high and the incessant beeping began again. I vented that and went back to bed. And another hour later, the humidity was now too high again. So I get up again and vent the humidity and then uh, leave the lid just a tiny bit open. I think I got it stabilized at that point, but it was quite the job. And between the power outage and that constant struggle to maintain proper temperature and humidity, I was very ready to put the little guys into the brooder a day early. Now, that meant that some of the eggs may not be finished hatching and it might cause them to uh, to die. Messing with the brooder, with the, sorry, the incubator, messing with the incubator like that, taking the lid off for long periods of time, the temperature drops down, the humidity drops way down. Um, I took the risk and as quickly as I could, I got the babies out and put the lid back on the incubator. More issues last night with humidity and temperature. <laughs> Scott wanted to turn it off, but I wanted to wait. One more bird had hatched out after I took out the original 52, and there could be others. And today I waited as long as I could and then opened the top to check out the eggs. I found a very healthy bird um, and the bird that could not use its legs and two more that were not out of their eggshell yet. I helped those two most of the way out and I waited. One of those looks pretty good, but the other... I don't know. He may not make it. And there, I found two others that died in their shell. Likely all that fiddling around with the temperature and humidity hurt them. Uh, it's all good. I was not sure we would have very many eggs hatch at all. And I'm very pleased with 53 currently very healthy birds and perhaps one or two more. Now, why do we have quail? Why not chickens? And that's the next topic. And that would be other animals that we want to have and chickens tops that list we eat a lot of chicken eggs scott eats a lot of quail eggs <laughs> chickens are a nat uh, are a natural uh, as best animals for a homestead in general and especially if you plan to make cheese they can drink the whey and it's a great protein supplement and another great advantage i mentioned earlier we can use them to eat the fly larvae and again a great protein supplement the larvae and that's less feed that we need to purchase they can eat table scraps and um, chickens are just all around really good uh, animals to have and of course th the best thing about them is they provide meat and or eggs depending on the breed that you choose we are looking for eggs but we will want some meat too uh, so we'll be choosing a dual purpose bird uh, as we just as we chose a dual purpose breed of cow, uh, we eat a lot of eggs, as I said, and of course, we love eating chicken. Uh, chicken are a great first animal to have on a homestead. They are small, easy to learn about fairly quickly. They provide food for your family. Now, they do need a good shelter, and therein lies the reason that we don't have them yet. Scott is putting all of his time into building the creamery. No time for building additional animal shelters. Uh, well, except for the quail. He built their hutches in about a day, I think. To build the chicken facilities, that would take up maybe up a couple of weeks. It also means learning and studying a new animal, 
and I said they're easy, um, but no matter how many animals you have experience with, a new one requires additional education and experience. And sometimes just uh, figuring out how to accomplish a needed task is, is a trial and error experience over days or weeks or, or months even. And don't get me wrong, I love learning about new animals and how to care for them properly to get the best result for them and for us. But it does take time and effort that we are currently investing in other areas. And so perhaps next year we will add chickens. If not then, the year after. Perhaps next year we will add pigs. Pigs are truly one of the best animals for a homestead. Rumor has it that they are easy to grow. Starting out with growing out small pigs purchased from someone nearby is the best way to start. Their growing season also intersects with our cheese making, and pigs also like that high protein way. They are a natural addition to a cheese making operation. I can't wait to give them a try. And if I mess up a cheese, they'll eat them. <laughs> There's a breed called Idaho pastured pigs in which I'm very interested. We shall see if I can find any in our area when the time comes. Uh, we'll be raising pigs for meat. And rumor also has it that pigs raised on whey. Uh, make some very tasty bacon. The last animal I'm going to talk about is rabbits. I, I just want to say that one more is a maybe uh, the rabbits are. I think rabbits would just be fun and they also produce a lot of meat really quickly. But I also thought I would have fun with fiber goats. So we shall see. You can only do so much. There's only so much time in a day and the best animals for a homestead list sometimes needs to be narrowed down to what is actually manageable. And that's it for today's podcast. There are lots of animals to choose from and many breeds uh, within each species. You'll have to do a lot of research on what will work for your goals. We prefer dual purpose animals. We prefer heritage breed animals. These both fit our goals to raise animals sustainably and with as uh, many natural husbandry techniques as possible. Each of our animals has a purpose on the homestead. They all contribute to the health of our homestead environment. Fertilizer, pest control, weed control, parasite control, and so on. All done with animals and some natural products such as apple cider vinegar and essential oils. That's what I make the fly spray out of. What do you think are the best animals for a homestead? What are your goals? What are your values? The last two questions define and support the first question. The system you put in place will be unique to you. I hope I've given you some ideas about how it might be done. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hop over to Apple Podcasts, sub sub subscribe, give me a five-star rating and review. And please, please, please share it on all your social media with your friends or family who might be interested in it. That is absolutely the best way to help out the podcast. Share it on your social media. Thank you so much for stopping by the homestead. And until next time, may God fill your life with grace and peace.